Hello and welcome to Ancient Gaming, where I cover all games and show you how to play them. Last time in this channel, I showed you the game and history of Hanapuda. You can click up here if you missed it. Today though, we're moving in time and space far away from Japan and back to medieval Europe to talk about these little dudes that look lifeless but have very much to say. This is Ancient Gaming and today we go deep into the Viking days to see what this game is really all about. So take your horns, fill up your meat and scroll to Nefatafel. Not all games enjoyed the same reputation in the Middle Ages, and even then, people would debate about their origins and rank them accordingly to how praiseworthy such games were. For example, in The Song of Roland, the younger knights are depicted playing tables, while Charlemagne's older and wiser men spend their time playing chess. This game in many ways fulfilled the same function in the northern part of Europe. Playing it well was seen as a mark of nobility, and it was also used allegorically in both secular and religious literature. Historians do not agree when exactly this game appeared, but more or less agree it develops from the Roman game of Ludus Latrunculorum, which is believed to have reached Denmark during the 400s. From that time onwards, however, the evidence is very vague, and we don't have clear finds for Nefatafel type games in Scandinavia until about the 750 AD and after, usually in the form of sets of pieces containing a single distinguished piece, and in many cases containing two different armies of an equal proportion. After that though, the game was taken by the Norse settlers to places as diverse as the British Isles, Iceland, Greenland, Germany, France, Estonia and even Ukraine, gathering a huge amount of popularity. Oddly enough, the game fell into obscurity after the massive success of European chess in Great Britain and Scandinavia, so it's quite unknown to many people nowadays. And some might know it by its little brother Tablut, which was played up until the 18th century by the Samis, an indigenous people from northern Scandinavia and part of Russia. You can find them nowadays in northern Sweden. In fact, it was not until the historian H.R. Murray pointed out that Tablut was associated with Nefatafel. And that's why many translations prior to his works, like that of Frithjof's saga, confuse the game with chess or draws. For this reason, many of Nefatafel's rules and gameplay have been reconstructed retrospectively from what we know of the game played by the Samis, mostly from the diary of Karl Linnaeus, the famous Swedish scholar and father of taxonomy, who was lucky enough to learn the game directly from them in his trip to Lapland. The Samis Tablut, however, close as it could be to the old Nefatafel, was not Nefatafel itself. And on top of that, Linnaeus' writings about the game contained some inaccuracies and mistranslations, and also ignored some other important parts of the game. For this reason, many historians like the same Murray and others have built upon Linnaeus' writings and other sources to create a more faithful reconstruction of the actual game played by the Vikings, if that is even possible, because we would have to assume it was played the same way in different places and different times, which doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, many of the rules of Nefatafel today are based on these scholars' assumptions on how the game must have been played. The game, though, it's lots of fun and quite unique in many ways, which is why some historians also struggle to categorize it within a fixed group of games like Raids or Chase games. This is due to the fact that Tafel games, despite displaying a wargame-like theme with two opposing armies whose members capture one another by custodianship, also share some of the mechanics that identify Chase games, like the fact that the two armies are of an equal size, that they are arranged radially rather than bilaterally, and that their objectives are also unequal, in that the royal side wins by getting the king to a place of safety. Many call Nefatafel the Viking chess, but it would be much more logical to call it a Viking Fox and Geese, or perhaps a Viking Ludus Latrunculorum, since Nefatafel is older than Fox and Geese. The game also falls into what in game theory would be defined as asymmetric. Each player does not earn the same payoff when making the same choice against similar choices of his competitors. So what does this mean? In chess, for instance, both players share an identical initial piece setup and objective. You could theoretically change both players and they will have the same move decisions available at their disposal. Of course, games can involve different grades of symmetry, and even chess is not perfectly symmetrical. 
but games in which both players' decisions and resources vary greatly from one another have usually to make a greater deal of effort to keep the game balanced. And it's precisely complex, balanced strategic gameplay what conferred chess its high status during medieval times, as it was considered one of the highest forms of intellectual prowess. Nefetafel, as I have said, enjoyed this same level of respect by the people who played it, so it's fair to assume it involved a higher degree of strategy and balance. But reconstructing its rules is especially hard due to this asymmetric nature, for we have to find different rules and setups for both attackers and defenders, and the scarcity of the sources compared to other medieval games doesn't help either. But fortunately, the sources we do have give us some clues about the nature of the pieces and how it was played. Some of the more interesting ones can be found in the Viking sagas of the 13th century, where Nefertafel is mentioned along the myths of the Old Norse gods and heroes. One of these sagas is the Herbarar saga of Hydrex, where we are told the story of Herbor and Hydrex along with the cursed magic sword Tierfinger, which by the way might ring a bell to those of you who love Lord of the Rings because this sword was crafted by the dwarves Dwalin and Durin. Anyway, the story follows the narrative you would expect from the genre, with a somewhat mythical and epic core interpolated with some historical places and characters. But one of its episodes is especially relevant to our game. So, there is this man named Gaston Blindy, who is a great enemy of the by now King Heydrich and that has been called by him to answer for his many crimes before the court of the king. But this court has a peculiar thing. If you don't like its judgment, you can always appeal to the king by propounding a riddle he cannot solve. Now, Gaston Blindy is no sage, and he's afraid he's going to lose, so he makes a sacrifice to the god Odin asking him for help. Odin accepts, and disguised as Gaston Blindy takes the riddle route, and one of these riddles goes as follows. What women are they warring together before their defenseless king, day after day the dark guard him, but the fair go forth to attack? This riddle ponder, O Prince Hydrek. Your riddle is good, Gaston Blindy, said the king. I have guessed it. This is the game of Nefatafel. The darker ones defend the Nephi, but the white ones attack. In another riddle, Odin says, What is that creature that kills men's flocks, with iron all about its bounds? Eight its horns are, but head it has none. There are many that move at its side. This riddle ponder, O Prince Hydrek. This is the Hun in Nefatafel, said the king. This little story, confusing as it sounds, gives us some clues. It suggests that the sides were distinguished as light and dark, as in chess, and that the dark ones were the royalists. The word Hun, also called Nephi in other sources, means fist and is the usual word for the king, and the eight horns refers to the distinctive way in which this piece was carved, perhaps to resemble a crown. The first riddle, by saying the king is defenseless, also suggests the king can't capture pieces. But again, in the second riddle we are told of a creature that kills men's flocks, so it's a bit confusing as well. I know, I know, why couldn't they just write a rule book? <sighs> that the king is a special piece is also deduced from another Viking saga, the Frithjof saga, where Frithjof is described in chapter 7 playing a chess game, which we now know is never doubtful, with his friend Bjorn. It's a fun little story where Frithjof is asked by a messenger to help Helge and Halfdan in a raid against King Hring. Frithjof, who apparently doesn't want to engage in the conversation with the annoying messenger until he has finished the game, actually responds him with metaphors through the moves he can perform with the pieces. A bear plays in your board which you cannot cover, and I shall beset your red pieces there. Bjorn responds. A double game, and two ways of meeting your play. Frithjof, your game is first to attack the Nephi, and the double game is assured. By attacking the Nephi, that is the king, or in this metaphor, the king ring, Frithjof is agreeing on participating in the attack. Besides from these written sources, we do have some pictures, boards, and even rooms that display what are and could be game boards and pieces of Nefatafel. The sizes and number of squares vary greatly sometimes, which has led to some confusion on whether we are looking at Nefatafel games, deviations from it, or just completely different games. In any case, the game's revived interest continues to bolster research, with the last text specifically targeting Nefatafel being written in 2017 in a very interesting article by Michael Schulte and even websites dedicated to the game like the one I point in the description that contain more information, links about where you can play online and even has hosted some tournaments in the past. The game itself can be found easily through Amazon, eBay, etc. and occasionally in some board game shops, craft shops and even some museum stores. I would mind in the 
has a Lofeni bra, but I know they sell it as well in the Fote Vikens Museum next to where I live. Thing is, if the place has anything to do with Vikings or Norse culture, you might find it there. But that's enough information for one video. As you can see, this topic has much more to it, so expect some updates in the future. Enough with the history. Let's jump into the gameplay section and learn how to actually play the game. Before starting, I should point out that the typical modern rules of Nefatafel have been influenced greatly by the commercial productions the game has experienced since the 19th century and the second half of the 20th century in particular. The game you see and the one I bought is that typified as the Viking game. It was released in 1981 and it's arguably the most popular set of Nefatafel you can find. But keep in mind that Nefatafel has different schools with regards to commercial production and especially scholarly thought. If you plan to buy this game or have it already, know that the rules that come with this particular version are quite outdated and leave some important aspects of the game to your imagination. But this is probably something you already noticed if you played a few games with it. The Nefatafel variant I will be covering today is called Copenhagen Nefatafel and it's the most popular rule set in official tournaments nowadays. It was originally formulated at Agenilsen DK, one of the most important sites for Nefatafel and the main one when it comes to competitive Nefatafel, so you can check the rules there as well. The game then, it's played like this. The dark pieces, or attackers, lay siege. Their goal? To capture the king. The light pieces, or defenders, must break the siege and get their king to safety. The game is played by two players, the king's side versus the attackers. Keep in mind that there are twice as many attackers as defenders. The attacker's side moves first. Then the players take turns. All pieces move any number of vacant squares along a row or a column, like a rook in chess. All pieces except the king are captured if sandwiched between two enemy pieces, or between an enemy piece and a restricted square. The two enemy pieces should be on the square above and below or on the squares left and right of the attacked piece, but never diagonally. A piece is only captured if the trap is closed by the aggressor's move. It is therefore permitted to move in between two enemy pieces. The king, by the way, may also take part in captures. There is also a shield wall rule for capturing a row of pieces on the board edge. A row of two or more tapplemen along the board edge may be captured together by bracketing the whole group at both ends, as long as every member of the row has an enemy tapplemen directly in front of him. A corner square may stand in for one of the bracketing pieces at one end of the row. The king, again, may take part in the capture, either as a part of the shield wall or as a bracketing piece. However, if the king plus one or more defenders are attacked with a shield wall, the attack will capture the defenders, but not the king. Now we'll cover restricted squares. Restricted squares may only be occupied by the king. The central restricted square is called the throne. It is allowed for the king to re-enter the throne, and all pieces may pass through the throne when it's empty. Restricted squares are hostile which means they can replace one of the two pieces taking part in a capture as we have seen before. The throne is always hostile to the attackers, but only hostile to the defenders when it is empty. The four corner squares are also restricted and hostile, just like the throne. The board edge is not hostile. This is important because there is other versions of Nefatafel which have a hostile board edge. Now let's see how the king's side wins. If the king reaches any corner square, the king has escaped and his side wins. There is also something called exit forts. The defenders also win if the king has contact with the boardettes, is able to move, and it is impossible for the attackers to break the fort. Now how do the attackers win? The attackers win if they can capture the king. This happens when the attackers surround him on all four cardinal points, except when he is next to the throne. If on a square next to the throne, the attackers must occupy their three remaining squares around him. The king, though, cannot be captured on the board edge. The attackers also win if they manage to surround the king and all remaining defenders, as they have prevented the king from escaping. Like other board games, there is a special rule for repetitions. Perpetual repetitions are forbidden. The player who causes the repetition must find an alternative move or else he loses the game. Also, if a player cannot move, he loses the game. If it is not possible to end the game, for example, because both sides have too few pieces left, then it is a draw. And this is basically all you need to know to start playing Copenhagen Nefatafel. If you have any doubt about the rules, you can write it down in the comment section. Remember that you can also check the rules at Agenilsen DK, as they have a written version of what I just told you. You can also check these rules at signingstand.com. I cannot recommend this page enough. The author has a lot of experience with Nefatafel, and even has written a book about it. The rules are fairly simple. 
but have some complicated details, so don't be afraid to go over them again if there was something you didn't catch. And that's everything for today, so don't forget to like the video if you learned something new, and subscribe if you want to learn more about all the role games and how to play them. Until the next time.